welcome to our Thursdays with Noma. Um, before we begin tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce Noma's art stroll coordinator, Martin Collins, who is coming to us tonight via video, um, who has a very special statement uh, to share with us. Uh, Michelle, can you cue up Martin for us? All right, I think Martin's coming to us. Here Good evening, go. everyone. Thank yeah. you for joining us. Chuck NYC is an upscale and modern pastry shop started by Jamal Edwards and Brad Doles five years ago. Together, they bring over 50 years of culinary and hospitality experience and are proud to share their passion with the Washington Heights Inwood community at 4996 Broadway and West 212th Street. They have three kinds of delicious croissants, delectable muffins, scones, scores of cookies and pastries, cupcakes, and a baker's dozen of fantastic cakes, tarts, chocolate confections, and great homemade ice cream. Check out their website, chalknyc.com, and follow Chalk NYC on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. The Northern Manhattan Arts Alliance thanks Chalk NYC for sponsoring Thursdays with Noma and Lindell Brookhouse Gill. Nerea? Back to you. <laughs> That's great. Um, thanks, Martin. Even if you're not here, we feel your presence. And thanks to Chalk NYC for your support and especially for your delicious uh, desserts. Um, again, good evening to all of you. I'm so happy to be here tonight for our Fall Thursdays with Noma series. My name is Neria Leva Gutierrez and I am the Executive Director of the Northern Manhattan Arts Alliance. Before we begin tonight, which I cannot wait to do, I'd like to thank the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs for supporting in part this program. Thursdays with Noma and its earlier iteration, Stay at Home Open Studios, were born out of the city's lockdown and especially out of a need and desire to connect with our community. What we've learned over the last 15 months is that these evenings have tremendous value in bringing us together and in providing wonderful opportunities for us to get to know one another in a dynamic and yes, fairly intimate, albeit virtual setting. And as you know, for those of you who have joined us week after week or on occasion, this program is an opportunity to get to know our amazing Uptown artists. It's an opportunity to learn something new or unexpected about these artists. And it's especially a chance for all of you to ask questions and engage in conversation with our featured artists. So please, as always, as the evening unfolds, we ask and encourage you to put your questions in the chat and we will be sure to give you a chance to ask them directly. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce tonight's featured artist. Lindell Brookhouse Hill is a representational painter and performance artist. She is also a storyteller. Nurtured by the downtown New York art scene of the 1980s and drawing inspiration from all that it offered, performance art, graffiti, experimental music, paintings, and Cuban folkloric music. Lindell earned her BA in music and ethnomusicology with a minor in art history from Hunter College. She studied photography and graphic design at the Art Academy of San Francisco and studied tonal painting with Alex Chiquitimo of the Chicago Art Institute. Her experience is as vast and varied as her body of work. She has worked as a volunteer teacher with young children on basic music, ele music elements, as a visual artist in New York and San Francisco. She has lived and performed in the East Village as part of Volti, a US and Mexican techno pop punk music group, recording and touring, touring in Europe, New York City and Mexico City, as a folklore mu musician studying and performing music of Afro diasporic Cuba with Yoruba, ceremonial performer and musician Felipe Garcia Villamil, and as a graphic designer for LBG Design. As an artist, Lindell is a painter for whom process is paramount. She believes in the value of developing a practice over time, assiduously working until that practice becomes a flow, a flow that translates into release from the demands of technique. The meditative state that results allows her to delve into particular moments in time, capturing light, color and form, becoming sensitive to rhythm and to routine. 
She is influenced by artists of the Ashcan school who like her seek out the individual against the backdrop of the shared human experience. Like New York, Mexico and the Mexican muralists of the 1930s and 40s have always occupied an important role in her life and in her work. Having lived on and off in Mexico for over 40 years, she cites the country's culture, colors, light and textures as life changing and life informing. Indeed, her recent residency in Mexico has inspired an extraordinary body of work about which we will hear tonight. Lindell has exhibited her work across the United States and Mexico, and she has participated in two of Noma's Women in the Heights exhibitions. We are thrilled to have an artist with us tonight who, in her own words, quote, believes that it is a constant push to be more brave, more bold, to paint like a punk rocker. Please join me in welcoming tonight's punk rock painter, Lindell. <laughs> <laughs> Lindell. Thank you so much, Neri. That was incredible. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining. And really, thank you so much for Noma and also Michelle and Martin and, of course, Neri for that incredible introduction. And also the opportunity to share because we haven't been able to get together. And I just love the idea that I could also share with people in Mexico and also people on the West Coast that know me from other painting residencies that I've been able to be there with people. And now um, we're gonna let a video happen and I'm gonna speak about my present work that I'm working on now. Love you guys. Hi, I'm Lindell Brookhouse-Gill and I'm a painter in Washington Heights, Manhattan, New York. And I've been lucky enough to be invited by Noma to share with you my studio and talk about my art a bit. So here goes. This is the main room of my studio. I share the space with my daughter presently. So we do music here. I paint here. We do yoga here. And a lot of creative work happens here. So, but I just wanted to share with you where I paint and how I paint a little bit. A lot of natural light. My windows face south, southeast, and I have beautiful light in this room. Today's a little bit of a overcast day, but that's actually perfect for painting because you don't get the harsh contrast of the sun on there. But often it's very sunny here, so I sometimes have to use shades. Anyway, as you can see, minimal chemicals. I try to use minimal chemicals, but I do paint in oil, so I do have to have some toxic materials. But uh, I just love the way that you can layer uh, with oil and using oil to do translucent work. It's very something that you you can't do very easily with acrylic and I was trained painting oil with oil and it's my go-to medium I do do watercolors um, as well and I work with and I can work with acrylic but I do prefer oil here's a couple of those pieces that you that I'm going to show more detail and speak to in the video following. And then this is a, where I work um, with my computer. And I will also show you some of the computer sketches that I do work with. OK, so you see my minimal space. Sometimes it gets a little more busy in here, depending on how long I'm here. As I'm here longer, things get a little bit more busy and more there's more things but mm, I wanted to show you a material that I'm working with um, that I got in Mexico it's called jute and uh, and it's like um, something that I'm working with to create texture so I add this to my canvas and it does this beautiful it gives these beautiful effects of like sort of ethereal night effects. So I'm doing a series where I'm working with 
this material called shunte. Shunte. It's a, a cactus. It's like a similar to what they make uh, mezcal with, but they uh, get a thread and from the. Here's some pieces I did using the shunte um, with the black gesso canvas. And then actually I worked with acrylic here. As you can see, we don't really have big dining room table or huge couches. And part of that is so that we can free up the space so that we can do other things. Yo. Since I've been traveling a lot, uh, I've kind of got it down where I know the basics of what I need and I also work on my computer a lot to compose ideas and work this way. So it, I can do pretty well with a very basic studio. I moved, I was in Mexico this past year for quite a few months and I figured out how I could work anyway. The painting, I'm an oil painter, so keep a usually set up my easel <laughs> here I work principally now on wood boards where I just stretch a canvas to wood boards so that I can store my paintings my finished work more easily because when you stretch a canvas onto a big stretcher board stretcher bars it they become very uh, hard to store, lots of space. And as you can see, I paint big. This is the series I'm going to speak to you about further. And also I can move my canvas because it's on wheels, which allows me to dry it in my hallway so that sometimes when I paint with oils, it can get a little bit smelly in here. Here's a piece I did. Uh, Staten Island Ferry building with the one train and um, as you know I work with scenes in New York and I love to capture New Yorkers in their elements. Here's a piece I did which I think was posted on the I'm going to move my canvas a little bit so we can get in here. This is about coming out of MoMA one evening. I was taken by the halal guys who sell right there outside of MoMA. And there's always a line there, and it always fascinated me. And I just loved the colors in the, in the early evening. The blues and the yellows contrasting early evening. And here's another piece that I did of another New York scene, 131st Street and Broadway. I'm always fascinated by the incredible infrastructure of the city and how things were built in these huge metal structures. I mentioned earlier that Sometimes I have to dry my canvases in the hallway <laughs> because it gets, especially large oil paintings, they can off-gas a lot of uh, the varnishes and the oils, and it, so it, it can get toxic. Anyway, here's also where I can dry and store... Uh, this is a hallway out to my room. I'll just roll my easel right out into the hallway. And luckily, I have wonderful neighbors. Never, they support me a lot. They love my work, and so there's never any issues. But I, I only leave it there for hours, open up the windows to try to get as much drying on them as possible, as fast as possible. <clears throat> anyway, this is a piece I did, one of the pieces of the elements. This is the water piece, and it uh, is part of the global warming series that I'm doing, four-piece global warming series I'm doing. 
And here, like you see, I have to like hang them. You have to hang them for quite a while. Oil paints take uh, oil paintings take a lot of time to dry, so you need to hang them flat. Otherwise, they don't stretch well. So this is where sometimes I'll hang. It's just closer. Sometimes I'll even leave the door open. smells my paintings and her wonderful cooking. Here is a video of my artist studio space at Architopia, which is a residency, painting residency in Pueblo, Mexico. And this was a shot of my studio space. For two and a half months while on the coast of Mexico in Oaxaca, I didn't have a studio, but I kept creating anyway. And I dedicated myself to drawing over 35 graphite portraits and small watercolors. Eventually, I started painting in the Art Catopia Artist Residency in Puebla. And because of that work, I was able to approach my large pieces as ideas and not be so encumbered by technique. And with that, I had more ability and confidence. Also, while on the coast, I met much of, my, much of a new community. This was a way that I was able to meet people, and ultimately I exhibited these portraits at the La Fe Cafe in Puerto Escondido. It was a way kind of of me to give back uh, by creating art to a community that shared so much with me. As a painter, I believe in the process. Whatever your medium practices, if you do it a lot, eventually, not only do you become better at your craft, but you can actually relax into the flow of being a part of a larger present moment. I paint a lot and draw a lot. I have my moments of doubt and downtime, believe me. But if I practice daily, it shows in my work and I actually find I'm less encumbered by my technique. Thank you. That is that was such a wonderful, wonderful video. Um, just beautifully produced and so rich in, in so many ways. You know, um, I, I love I love um, how you you talk about your studio. You know, because you know, this is a this is about studios. This is sort of you know open studios and that kind of idea. But you know, you are your studio. Um, you know, wherever you are, you you are your studio. And and I and I really love that concept. I also love this idea of 
um, how your process and how your dedication to process and practice sort of allows you almost to, you know, sort of transcend those kind of limitations, you know, and, 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 and sort of you, you reach a place where um, the process becomes uh, not necessarily automatic, but just part of, of, of you know, the, the, as you describe the flow. Um, I, I'm so intrigued by your residency, um, you know, in Puebla and in Oaxaca. Can you tell us a little bit? I know you're working on a really special series um, that you started in Puebla. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, um, about my, the latest work that I'm working on, which I'd like to talk about because I know people have not been able to see any of my work and I've been sort of like posting on Instagram, but and I sort of just wanted to talk a little bit about it because I'm kind of excited about this series because it's a, a, a little bit different because it has more of a, I don't want to say necessarily political, but it d definitely is, um, you know, it's a, I'm calling this series the uh, circumstances of the making. And it's about incorporating the four elements, water, fire, wind, and earth. And um, this particular, and it's really about um, an allegorical warning about the health of our planet, sort of. So there's stories within stories. And this particular one is the water piece. And um, this one I call the, well, there's like a couple, there should be a couple of pieces. The entire piece, this is a detail. If you could go back just to the whole piece. Yes, thank you. This, um, this is called the Lost City of Heraclean and the Sea Turtles. And the Heraclean was a ninth century BC Nile Delta city that sunk uh, really fast due to rising water floods and the liquidation of the land. So it's very interesting. It seems to be like very um, contemporary concerning and I uh, was swimming, I could go on and on, but also the, the, um, the reason I bring in the sea turtles is that there was a Mayan myth that saw sea turtles at, as the backs, their sea turtle backs as the origin of the earth. So, and because they're an endangered species, you know, there, I see this as a fragile balance between like the coastal land and the sea and sea levels. So, and I chose an Octavia Butler uh, quote to go on this because uh, it's meant to push us to understand the importance of accepting and embracing change. I think change is all we knew. I'm a big advocate of change and understanding change and trying to be as relaxed as possible with the idea of change because you, if you're holding on. If you, you need to be able to let, let go and loosen up about change. And, and I think so many people are not willing to change. And that's a big issue with the whole health of our planet anyway. And so the, the quote, it says, all that you touch, you change. All that you change, changes you. The only lasting truth is change. God is change. And this is from the parable of the sower. Really love uh, Octavia Butler. And I think like especially that book and her whole apocalyptic, apocalyptic LA uh, book, uh, writing is very powerful. So uh, it all sort of came together. And then um, the next piece I wanted that I'm working on is um, actually has the element is re reference to fire. Oops, that's, um, yeah, let's go to, yeah, that one. Um, this, is, this is a piece that I call Women of the Apocalypse. And um, this is directly influenced by a 17th century Baroque painter from Puebla, Mexico. I, I saw it in a Baroque museum and I had these elements, you know, I had the archangel and I had this cool shot of my daughter, like doing mm. this really intense, like, feelings of like skating and freedom and power. And then there was somehow that the together they look like this powerful, you know, women warriors, you know? So, and then I'm walking in the uh, Baroque Museum and I see this painting, uh, it's called The Apocalypse of the Woman. And it was by a painter by the name of Cristobal de la Villa Pando. 
sorry, Cristobal de Villalpando. Anyway, he was a Baroque painter of Puebla and I was inspired and it tells the story of chapter 12 of the book of Revelations. And it, it represents, to me, this painting represents the need for women warriors to come together to sort of protect future generations from malevolence and of the man, of malevolence of mankind and the fires that consume the earth. And it has a quote. Well, it doesn't have a quote. It, it was actually inspired by an Audre Lorde uh, quote that I read, but it's really my words. And it says, and it's a combination of Spanish and English, and it's called Guerreras contra malda, malvado, awakening fearful souls like a phoenix transcendent. And there's a lot of symbolism here that I won't go into because it takes a lot of time, but there's a lot of threes and twelves involved and the seven headed, you know, snakes. And there's just a lot of um, symbolism, but the whole Baroque, uh, the feeling that I have about Baroque, the Baroque's, uh, era in general also is very powerful because I feel like, um, you know, there was a lot of wealth taken out of Mexico on the backs of indigenous people. So that's a whole nother feeling I have about the Baroque and the apocalypse and just malevolence of like society. And then the last one, I'm just gonna go quickly. I wanna show it's called, um, it's about wind and it's called the storm. And this is uh, inspired by um, let me see if I can show you. Yeah, thank you. This one is really inspired by, um, you know, how storms have been hitting New York more frequently. And this might be even a portrayal of something that possibly could be worse coming. And I kind of like the irreverent style of Hunter S. Thompson's writing. So when I saw this quote by Hunter S. Thompson, I said, oh yeah, you know, that's like the thing that can inspire me to paint bolder and more punk. And so this was also, it's a very big piece, it's six feet. They're all very big, these pieces. And, and the bigger you paint, the bigger brushes you have to use. And it's just kind of like, it allows me to be less worried about detail and just more into the feeling of the painting. So um, the quote here is, the man who procrastinates in his choosing will inevitably have his choice made for him by circumstance. And it just seemed so apropos to the idea that, you know, if we don't change our attitudes and minds about what's happening to our earth, you know, eventually we will have to confront what's happening. Well, we are confronting what's happening. And um, yeah. That, and then I have another one coming, which is the earth piece and it's a work in progress. And that will, if you, if we show the work in progress, um, there, uh, that, uh, yeah, up to the one with the, yes, that. So this is an idea, you can get an idea of how I may start with a computer sketch. So this is a sketch where I I'm taking elements of on a computer and I'm putting them together so I can get a sort of feel for how things look together. And this is an I the idea of this piece is really um, about the earth. And I've been very inspired by Paul Stamets' um, study of the mycelium. He's like the mushroom guy, and you probably saw maybe his documentary uh, called Fantastic fungi and it really got me thinking about like earth as and the importance of mycelium and his his thought and I think it's really interesting is that you know he believes that nature has its own language and that we have not really figured out how to communicate with it and and the mycelium and how it connects to all the trees and there's a conversation that's happening in nature that we're not even aware of anyway he's also looking at mush they've the mycelium's been on the earth for like 700 million years. I mean, they're, they're really, they were like the first things growing on the earth, basically. And um, I like this Pablo Neruda quote. I don't know exactly what I'm going to put here yet. It's obviously way in the process. And as I paint it, 
and the pietas there because I see like the pietas like sort of the pity, the human, you know, the human tragedy. And then this character in the front is sort of like um, representing all mankind. But I haven't really, like I said, it's in the process, but I am gonna definitely have the earth piece with mycelium in it. And it's gonna be, it's gonna be awesome. I know it's gonna be really big, it's gonna be awesome. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the Pablo Neruda quote, well, the, that I liked was, um, you do not hear the con don't do you hear the constant victory in the four four race of time the foot race of time sorry let me read it again well it's there do you not hear the constant victory in the human foot race of time i just love that idea it kind of gives you an idea that like humans are in this like constant you know idea that we have to win and we have to be on top and and it's like the foot race, it keeps going and going and going. And so that I know I'm definitely gonna like try to use the Neruda and then try to understand it or make it cohesive with the piece, which is basically talking about Paul Stemmett's idea of how na the nature's networks will, will, save, will save the environment, but it will do it with, with us or without us because unless we understand it's not, and are willing to change, it's really not gonna, we're, we probably won't be here. And it's really sad when I talk to younger, the younger generation and they sort of live in the moment. And I love that obviously, but there's, it's also like an idea that they're without hope that things are gonna get better. So that's always like really sad for me. And I do hang out a lot with younger people and it, it is a sad moment. But anyway, um, and also I just wanna say that these pieces with the written words are kind of returning back to a time when I did graffiti. And there's a, a shot of me like as a graffiti. Yeah, this, this was a piece of graffiti that I did in the eighties and where I would write these kind of cryptic like sentences. And, and, and so I see this, these, this series as a coming back to like these messages almost as a modern retablo and retablos are those we know as those tin paintings that have like the stories painted and then written on the bottom. So there's sort of like a version of that and there's religion involved, which retells their religious icons. So it's just, it's all these ideas that are like coming together for this bigger, and I'm hoping that I am able to show it someplace because like, for example, the water piece, you just can't really see it. Um, in person, it's so much better because I really worked on a, a lot with a lot of layering. And in Mexico, I had a lot of time to do that. So that was really great. Um, this is, I mean, this is, it's, it's so rich. I, I almost feel like we need a part two to get to so many of these issues. Um, one of the things I find so interesting, you know, is this, the light motif, this notion, you know, of change, you know, you talk so much about um, change. And I, I think, in particular right now with COVID um, and with everything that sort of we've gone through in the last year and a half, you know, this question of, of change becomes so important and, and, and it really takes on, you know, a, a, a sort of a new um, significance, this idea that there's, um, there's sort of bravery and change and there's a necessity to change and, and this idea that humans need to sort of take stock of where they've been, where they are and where they wanna go. Um, and you know, you talk about young people, and I, and you know, it's it's so interesting. It is true that young people, um, you know, aren't thinking about the future. You know, and in some ways, it's the luxury of being young, right? Because, you know, when you don't have to think about the future, you get to just be very much in the present. And you know, as as adults, we, we're always trying to live in the present. We have to remind ourselves to live in the present. Um, and young people just seem to exist there, you know, which yeah. poses all. So it's an interesting. I mean, as an older person, we're almost like, you know, how many more years do I have? So like I, right. I say, I saw in New York Times and said like, or some maybe it was J Jerry Saltz or something said, you know, in nine years, there's going to be seven huge cities that are going to be underwater. Underwater, right. Like, yeah. You know, seven years, 10, 20 years, what do I right. got left, right? 
but my children, you know, and people, my friends, you know, who are young, you know, I'm thinking, wow, like if Amsterdam doesn't exist in right. nine years, nine years, yes, it's now, right? it's lit. So, yeah. so that's really sad for me. I mean, well, you know, there'll be other cities, whatever, but I'm just saying for them, you know, it's, I think the future is m way more important. They're like thinking about maybe having children or maybe not having children because, because what are they bringing their children? And so anyway, this piece is just like bubbling up some sort of interior, like desperate feelings that I have that obviously came out. And, and I wanted to paint really big because I had been on the beach for, or like on the coast for like two and a half months and I was painting all these little watercolors and doing all these kind of tight, uh, you know, I was working on my skills, right? And then when I got to Pueblo, I was just like, oh, you know, like I got the biggest canvas bars I could find and I got the biggest canvases I could buy. And I was just try trying to like paint as big as I could. And, and it sort of came out, it just like these blues came out and then I was swimming with the turtles on and then, like if it rained really hard, the wastewater would come down into the ocean and then all the turtles would just like get leave, you know? So there was like all these like beautiful things contrasted with these kind of scary things. So, and then COVID was there. It was like, it was a uh, kind of an intense time, but um, my residency in Pueblo was amazing because I got to, um, it, they really, uh, stressed like reading some sort of very academic texts, which also was a challenge for me, but it was also really great yeah. to think of like all these different things and sort of, they were really gave me a lot of writing on critical analysis of like Western and Eurocentric educational systems and how, you know, high culture or it was the better culture and how that was sort of, yeah. um, uh, you know, how that's the education that I got. That's sure. How it, yeah. How you're re right. The academic training. It's, it's such an extraordinary city. We have a couple of questions that I want to get to. Um, Suzanne Gannon, I think you had some questions you wanted to ask. Can we Hello, Suzanne. unmute Suzanne? Here we go. All right. It's so, so great to be here. Lindell, it's great to see your beautiful work. Nerea, thank you for doing this. And Ariana, I spied Ariana. Um, Lindell, I have two questions for you. First is um, sort of art in general in your life as, as um, something that is in your heart and something for which you have trained so meticulously. And then you sort of had to do other things with your art for a very long time in order to have a career and family. And now you have taken it back into your life center stage with gusto, with so much life. And I just wonder how that, how that happened, like how you reconnected, but you reconnected with such force. Well, you know, it's really interesting. Um, I sort of stopped painting at one point as a young person when I was like painting, like I said I was gonna be a painter and that was, and then I saw a Robert Rauschenberg show and I said, oh my God, I'm just a dilettante. Like, oh, I'm like, ugh, I'm a craftsperson. I'm not a painter, blah, blah, blah. And then I sort of got involved in making money. And then like you said, I, da, da. and then at one point about, I don't know, now seven years ago, I just said to hell with that. And we used to work together. So, uh, you know, you're one of the better people that I know from that experience. And when I got spit out of all that, I was just like, you know what? I don't care. I'm doing this because I want to do it. And then I started to do some kind of cool paintings. And then I kind of got all wrapped up in like, oh my God, you know, the art world, uh, how am I going to, you know, deal with this art world? And then I found that the more I relaxed and didn't care and just said, okay, just embrace whatever comes and just flow with it. And then like Miria was saying, like I, I really into the process, the process was my trainer. It was like, it kind of got me away from all the headspace of like, 
preoccupation with the art world, which, you know, like I'm really not really a part of, but I want to be a part of, but I don't want to be a part of, but I want to be a part of. It's that kind of pull always. But the best work is when you just are in that flow because you've been doing, you do it so much that it becomes then part of, how do I even explain it really? Like everything that when you're not practicing a lot is very precious and kind of detail and everything becomes like, a, but when you do a lot of it, it just becomes more like a flow and a natural feeling. And it's, it really is how you teach yourself to become an artist by doing it a lot because all those experiments that you're doing, all of that work that you're doing, all those ideas like, oh, I don't draw well enough or I don't this or that, by doing a lot of it, it just, that just irons right out. You just start doing you. And that is like, I'm still there. I'm still, I'm still working. I will work for my whole life, but I'm telling you the last painting I did, the storm piece, I think is one of my better pieces and it's gonna, and I hope that they just keep getting better from here, you know? It's beautiful. It's beautiful work. Thank you. Thank you so much for your question. Thank you, Suzanne. You look great. We also have a question from Sara. Sara, are you are you there? Can I unmute you? Oh, there you are. Oh wait, I'm gonna unmute you. There you go. Hi, yes, I love the presentation. I wrote my question initially in Spanish, but I'm happy to now say it in English. And um, sí, yes, en español. Ah, perfecto, pues en español. <laughs> Veo mucha influencia mexicana. Y me preguntaba qué es la conexión, el vínculo que te lleva a reflejar la cultura mexicana en tu arte, en tus pinturas. Gracias. Okay. So her, her question was that she saw a lot of uh, influences of Mexico and how did I come to like all those influences in Mexico? And I could respond in Spanish. I love, I got better at my Spanish, you know, but I, what can I say? I've been in, as Miriam said, I've been in and out of Mexico for like the last four years of my life. It really was a connection that I had that probably relates back to early childhood memories of like being in a big Italian family or something and then losing that and then rediscovering Mexico. And it felt like that. And all of a sudden it was sort of like a, almost a, anyway, it's, it's the colors, it's the, it's the, diversity it's the contrast like you see like this guy look look at this guy he's like taking a break but obviously he's a street worker you know and then they got the lady on the hustle like selling her breads or whatever and like life goes on and it's just like these contrasts you just see these things like look at the road look at the street too like you're walking along you have to like kind of pay attention you can't be like sleepy and in a you know a dream zone it's like Mexico is like in your face, like all the time, right? The colors, the, the people, the smells, the language, the, there's just so many things that it's so, but I mean, like, look at the, like, the, this is like stuff that I would see in the churches, like all the time. I loved going into the churches. They have some very scary things. Like they have a lot of Christ, like in coffins, like with all this blood and these like things. And, and you look at that and you go, oh my God, like, here you're there to like pray for your mother or whatever. And then here's like this like super scary thing. There's so many contrasts. There's so many, uh, you know, the ballroom gowns, the big gowns, these big parties that they have, the lovers in the parks, you know, it's just like so many contrasts of like uh, good, bad, ugly, hot, cold. It's just like everything. So Mexico to me is just such a vibrant, place that um and then of course the painters you know some of the amazing painters and so like i was saying so inspired and also the textural work rafino tamayo amazing painter um and especially the painters from oaxaca i sort of really like southern oaxaca's like textural pieces and um i just want to give also a shout out to a bunch of like uh present painters that I love too. Uh, Reggie Burroughs Hodges, amazing work. Reggie Burroughs Hodges, this one, yeah. His, I love this, this 
artist's work. He's a contemporary, like he's upstate New York someplace. And I saw a show, Doe's Green. I don't have a picture of a Doe's Green there. Jane Dixon, she's an amazing New York painter. Doe's Green was a, a, a graffiti writer who now does amazing paintings in, um, in, and he lives in Brazil. Oh, there's a Jane Dixon. I really love Jane Dixon's work. I think she's really talented. Javier Hill, I don't have a piece, but he's a, he's my um, ex uh, brother-in-law and he was an amazing, amazing, he is an amazing, amazing painter. And then, um, oh yeah, Joan, Joan Eardley, she's a Scottish painter. She's now passed away. Uh, go up, I think it was up, like that sort of, yeah, she, like this this woman, like I was trained to paint like Velazquez, you know, that my t painting teacher taught me like, but I want to paint like Joan Eardley because like to me, she's representation, but she's such a punk rocker. She's like so, such an amazing. And then of course, you know, uh, the Ashcan School, oh yeah, Velazquez, the, uh, the Ashcan School, I really love the Ashcan, painters they paint in New York you know Reginald Marsh amazing um, Edward Hopper a lot of people think my work looks like Edward Hopper strange guy but a great painter um, George B Tooker like there's so many amazing Ashcan painters that I really like to even late Turner when he went blind I love Turner uh, Monet like the water lilies like that was a close-up I saw recently at the Met that was like incredible um the his like as the as old as painters got older they got a little more like blind and like less worried about what society had to say or whatever and they just freed up to do whatever they wanted and those I, I guess I guess that's what yeah, it's it's so great. I mean, I, I would I, I know you were saying you were trained by Velasquez and you, like Velasquez and I, I would argue that you know Velasquez was a kind of a punk rocker in his own right during yeah. his yeah. time. That's you know? true. That's true. And, you know, I mean, there's you know there's a reason why the 19th century artists were very piqued by him. You know, he was That's doing true. something you know very different. I think in terms yeah, as a tone being trained as a tonalist, it it really was about tone and it yeah. wasn't about you know, fine brush strokes. Right. You know, and, 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 you know, and I, I always say that, you know, Vela there's no one who paints whites like Velasquez, you know, the, the variation of, of, of the, of the whites in his works, I think to me, or, or one of his most kind of, you know, right. that's a whole other conversation. The light, the, the attention to drama, dramatic light is absolutely powerful. Yeah, and 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 also his um his you know you talk about contrast you know Velasquez is someone even Las Meninas you know there are pieces in Las Meninas are so delineated you know and the forms and then there's you know um these kind of notations you know where where the paint is just you know the impasto and and it's sort of a you know a suggestion you know he's 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 looking ahead in a way that I think you know like I said that's why I think the 19th century artists were so enamored of of, of him because he really was doing something um you know different um, this, yeah, this like is this has been so so fascinating I think we have one last question that I want to ask and then we're going to move to rapid fire to close out the evening I think Maria Maria Cristina Maria are you here you had a question I think is Maria here? Yes, I'm here. Hi. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't have my video on. Uh, but Lindell, so I, I will talk like that. Otherwise, I will uh, lose too much time to put the video on. But I'm always, you know, curious to to. I would love to hear more about your choosing of colors because it is so powerful. The colors you use, and and I, I think you're talking about the contrast, the drama. But I would love to hear more about that because I, I, I love the colors you use. Yeah. Thank you so much. Well, you know, I think that um, it's also like a, um, a t you know, we have our tastes. You know what we like, and I, and as a graphic designer, I think I was trained to um, through the years of working to like look for contrasting things, like big bold contrasting things. I've always been. 
I don't want to mean to say like bragging, but I, I've been good with color. I always, I always was good with color, I think, like my taste. You know, I'm, my mother was Italian. My father was Dutch. You know, the Dutch have like a history of like great, you know, design, great colorist. The, the Italians have like great design, great taste in, you know, design and colors. So I don't know. I always had like, I like colors. I like contrasting colors. I love blues and warm like blues and oranges together. It's a, I love that. So like in the halal guys in this, if you look at the shadow in this painting right here, the sh it's, it's actually blue. It's completely blue. And then you have like yellow, uh, the creamy yellow sidewalk, it's completely blue. So I, I like the idea of like, put, but if you saw the reference, the reference has, is a pretty gray sidewalk. It's a pretty gray sidewalk. But like I, when I saw it in the sun, you know, it, to me, there is blue there. And if you're trained as a painter, you'll see blue there, but I like to push those colors. And also, I, well, today I was reading a very strange article um, and I don't have it up on my screen, so I can't like reference it exactly, but they were talking about how in the past, like bright, colorful things were seen as low culture. And that in Europe, that like the muted colors was seen as more sophisticated. So I, I'm interested in that dialogue now too, because me, I love bright colors and I love like pop, like the pop, pop art was like about bright colors. And I always like really love bright colors. Now, I don't love bright colors that mean things like patriotism or necessarily like the three bright, the three uh, kind, the like yellow, red and blue like together. But if, but if I have to choose, I'm gonna take that blue and yellows because I love the contrast. So I love contrasting colors. So, you know, the cool colors, the blues, the greens, the, you know, the, the things that are, make you feel cool and then the warm things, like for example, this one too, like the front face of the building is very cool, but then the light is, it, this is always where I'm looking for, like contrasting colors. Or like, look at the, there's a watercolor piece, like the, the orange and yellow, yeah, that one. The, this one, that's Mexico. Like you just see people paint their buildings, like with this lime green, like chartreuse color, and like this, incredibly bright orange column. And you just say, wow, how could I ever have chosen those two colors together? No, I can't. So I just get so inspired by, by those, that color combination. And to me, it looks almost Dutch in a weird way. I don't know, in the sixties, like the Dutch were really into like these kind of bright colors maybe because it's so gray there most of the time of the year. Maybe they have to contrast it that way. I don't know, but I, I I didn't really study color theory, but I know enough of, about color theory to understand that contrasting colors work very well together. Thank you. So, thank you so much. That's, that's a great um, question. We are um, almost at the hour mark. So I want to sort of as our Noma tradition uh, uh, dictates to close out with a few rapid fire questions. These are just kind of, you know, off the cuff questions and unrehearsed and just sort of to see um, how you might answer them. Um, one of the things I was really struck by were your portrait, the portrait series that you did in Oaxaca. I mean, those were just extraordinary. Those graphite um, drawings um, really were just really spectacular. I'm curious, um, as someone who um, has spent a lot of time doing portraits, what, um, what part of the human face um, is your favorite and why? What are you drawn uh, to? I really like teeth. I know that sounds crazy, <laughs> but like I can, if, if somebody has good teeth, I can forgive anything on their face for their good teeth. I, I have to say that other than that, but having to, when you paint a portrait of somebody, like you have to get it right. And I don't always get it right. And some, a lot of times I get very close, but sometimes I, sometimes I completely miss, but like, it's so crazy 
Like I might look at a face and say like, there's, it's just not them. It's just not them. And I'll have to like keep tweaking and then it'll be something that I don't even realize like this part of the, sh I need to extend. And you can extend somebody's cheek, like their chin, just like a half inch. And all of a sudden the whole face completely changes. Mm -hmm. So it's very fascinating. Portraits are very fascinating, very frustrating. Um, it, it got me to really meet a lot of people on the beach because they were fascinated. They loved the fact that I would paint them. Then we had that show, they saw it. I gave them all copies, so great. Xerox copies. And then I gave them the copy of the portrait because they all sit in my, they're in my drawing book. Yeah. They That's see. fantastic. Um, all right, so here's another question. And we didn't talk too much about this, but I know it, it informs so much of your life, you know, ethnomusicology and the music background. Um, what is on your uh, ideal playlist these days? Oh, well, I have to say that right now I'm into the Wu-Tang Clan. I really, I'm sorry, but I read that book by Riza and I just thought he is my new favorite person of all time. And I know there's a lot of controversy, whatever. I don't care all about that. And I'm watching that series, you know, I'm like totally addicted. But I'm listening, I ended up listening to a lot of rap lately and a lot of Wu-Tang, a lot of Wu-Tang Clan. I'm listening to right now would be, I know this well, and also it gives me sort of like, sometimes I just need to have attitude to push myself to paint more boldly. I want to paint more boldly. I've been trained and tend to, to get, you know, uptight and hold on. And I need to be just free to just be, a badass, you know? <laughs> okay, um, here's another question. What was your um, favorite book growing up? Oh my God. Okay, so this book? is embarrassing to me. Okay, this is kind of embarrassing to me. I grew up in the Midwest and I grew up in a family that didn't have a lot of books in the house and I hated school. And I was in like kind of, you know, very middle of the road, whatever, public schools. And I hated to read. And also I was dyslexic. So I was at, in the second grade sort of like put down for reading badly. Anyway, I didn't start reading until I got, until I left that whole thing. And then I realized that there were all these really cool people around me that were amazing readers. So I had to catch up a lot. Now, let me think of like, um, well, I, I don't know about, uh, I, so I can't really, okay, I'm trying to think off the bat what was like really something impressive when I was little. I can't because I wasn't really reading when I was little. What about, what about now, older? But now I'm reading Luke San, Lucy Sant's book, mm. uh, which I, I love him. He's an irreverent writer too from, from this is his, their latest book. And I love it. Irreverent stories about the East Village and the lower, the lower Manhattan, late seventies, early, early. Yeah, 80s. that seems to be another kind of, you know, theme with you, the irreverence, you know, I, I, I like Yeah, that. like, yeah. you know, not being controlled. I'm not really into control. I don't like to control people. And I well, it sounds like you seek out ways to not be controlled, right? You talk about transcending you know, technique I, in a way. Young, yeah. I was young and I was in San Francisco and I used to go to the deaf club. It was a place called the deaf club and you could go, it was actually a deaf club, but it was a punk rock venue. And I could just be completely free. For the first time in my entire life, I was completely free to do anything I wanted. And living in the Lower East Side in the 80s, yeah. again, you could be anything you want. And then, you know, you get life, it presses you down, and then you like start thinking like, oh, I got to do this, I got to make this money. And now I realize nothing matters. You don't have to do anything that is prescribed. And so I'm just trying to remember to be free and irreverent and just fearless fearless exactly <laughs> all right then we've got two more last two questions one is and this is sort of a noma staple question you're having a dinner party you have three guests that you can invite dead or alive real or fictional who are they 
Oh, okay. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna say definitely for Con James Baldwin has to be there. Um, then I'm gonna say um, he makes me laugh. I'm gonna say that my daughter Ariana, she's got to be there because she's the critical wheel in the cog. And I would say, I would say Emma Goldman maybe as a just like kind of like a pillar of interesting woman who would went through so much or maybe Mata Hari, you know, like Mata Hari was like totally misunderstood. You know, she was supposedly the spy. That was totally made up. She's just a free woman that loved sex. I don't know. I, there are so many people that would like, I would love to have at my dinner party, including a lot of people who had joined us tonight. I really wish that I could have dinner with them too. And well, it I'm sounds so like you're you're maybe more of an open house, right? Which just uh, you know, kind of a, a, a buffet of people coming in and, and coming out, which I love yeah. that idea. All mm -hmm. right, one last question to close out the night. What um, is your motto? What are your words to live by? I feel okay. like I have to deal with them so, right now, but let's okay, sort of- so I have this uh, analogy, like I'm a little ant and I'm dragging this like, leaf down the beach you know and i'm next to the waves that are crashing and i'm like doing i'm this little ant i'm working really hard and dragging this leaf down the the beach and all of a sudden a wave comes and like just smashes into me and i say i could go two ways i could just like lose the leaf and get all pissed off and say oh my god i have to go back get the leaf drag it or i could just jump on that leaf and just ride it when the wave Woo! that is my analogy for life. Like, just go with it. Just don't like be pissed off and start over. Just grab onto whatever's happening and just ride it. Ride it. What can I say? And that is why you are a punk rock painter. <laughs> 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 thank I you so much punk, i am a punk rocker it's, it's great kind of i love it i love i love that i mean it just kind of brings it all together this was so great um i've enjoyed this tremendously um i as i said i feel like we need a you know a, a round two um well, we because have so there much more because yeah. Miriam was spent time a lot of time in Pueblo, Mexico, and we got some good stories. I did. We've got a lot of unfinished business there to talk about. So I look forward to that. All the Thank best. You. Thank you so much, Noma. Thank you so much, Nerio. Thank you so much, Michelle, for hooking me up and getting all my emails today. And thank you so much. Thank you to Martin, who invited me to do this. And thank you, everybody who came. You're so important to me in my life, and I appreciate you all so, so much. Oh, thank you. This was truly, truly a joy. Thank you all for being here tonight. And speaking of Martin, he is coming to us again via video. He's got a few things to share with us before um, we go. Uh, so uh, Michelle, if you can queue up Martin, uh, he wanted to be here, but uh, he wasn't able to, but he's here with us in spirit and he is here with us via video. So if we could have Martin come back to us, that would be great. Here he is. Join us at 7.30 p.m. next Thursday, November 11th, for Thursdays with Noma and Nadima Agod, artist, illustrator, curator, and educator, sponsored by Inwood Hills Spirits and Wine Room. Noma's technical assistance workshop series continues in November and December with grant writing, websites for artists, how to create highlight reels, and much, much more. Please visit our website, nomanyc.org, for details. And you can read the Northern Manhattan Arts Alliance newsletter, become a member, sign up to receive email alerts, see a calendar of events, and submit your own events, all on our website, nomanyc.org. Thank you all for joining us tonight, and have a great weekend. <laughs> thanks, Martin, and thanks to all of you. Lindell, it's truly been a joy. Thank you so much for being Thank with us. Thank you again for the opportunity. Tonight. I super appreciate you guys. All right, everybody. Good night. Thank Bye. you. Bye.